last installment of the Holloway Spring series of poetry. We have an inordinately, exhilaratingly apt reading tonight, I believe, I trust. Um, first, we'll have Adam Ahmed reading, and he'll be introduced by Sylvia Lee. And then Jasper Burns will introduce Adam Boyer. Got up at three this morning, took two planes, but it's still full of vitality. Um, that's really all I have to say. Happy birthday, Adam. But first things first. Um, one of the concepts Adam and I work on together and think about a lot together is this idea, this notion of a generous narcissism, kind of social um, notion of self-love. So I'm going to begin by talking about myself. Um, get to All right, so over my time in the Berkeley English Department, the Holloway series has granted me the incredible opportunity to publicly introduce and then hang out with Amiri Baraka and Harriet Mullen, two of my all-time heroes. And earlier this semester, it gave me the chance to contribute to a powerful celebration of Mr. Baraka's life and career in the wake of his death in January, bringing my engagement with the Holloway full circle as I had introduced him in just my second month of school here in this room. I was fucking nervous. But I am most gratified by and grateful for the honor of introducing tonight's graduate student poet, one of my closest friends in the entire world. In two short weeks, I graduate from this department, which would not be possible without his love, encouragement, support, and friendship. It is so fitting to end my time here with this beautiful opportunity to talk briefly about the wonders of Adam, for it has been the most beautiful opportunity yet to have become friends here, to study together, and roam together, and party together. Adam Ahmed is a sixth year doctoral candidate in our department who specializes in romanticism and critical theory. His brilliant dissertation project discusses how Coleridge, Wordsworth, and Blake revised then emergent questions about empiricist reason, exploring how each challenged the notion of a secularism then on its way to hegemonic ontic status. In recasting the relationship between secularity and romantic aesthetics, Adam explores the ways in which secular ontology became the conditional possibility for contestatory yet appositional idioms of ontological possibility, including those of faith, reverie, supernatural imagination, and collective satisfaction. The range and depth of Adam's thought woven into the parameters of his academic work to undo such parameters and reconstitute them are astounding, extending into the Frankfurt School, French Surrealism, contemporary poetry, religious studies, pop culture studies, and queer theory not to mention a loving and precise ear for music, most joyfully displayed in the shared intimacy of listening live together, which has included for him and me, Trust, Cut Copy, Charlie XCX, Big Frida, Juicy J, ASAP for Twice, Andre Nicotina, Diana, Astra, Young Galaxy, Killer Mike and LP, Ten Snake, Anna Managuchi, Chrome Sparks, and Plastic, and plastic Plates. And that's just in the past academic year. Um, you guys got to get on our level. <laughs> we have shared common ears and danced to the music together. We have heard music where we hadn't thought there was any. Or in Fred Moten's words, we found dances waiting for dancers. Cashing in on one of the few, and in my view, underutilized privileges of being a senior graduate student. About a year ago, I whispered to two first year PhDs at a party they were throwing. Hey guys, you want to know a secret? to which they assented with tipsy nods. That man right there, Arab dude speaking softly and drinking all the whiskey, that's the genius in our department. Between our friends, Spencer Cauldron's thinking on, thinking on fun, another genius, my work on love and Adam's work on faith, we have become closer in our own practice of all three, and we have shared the most rare opportunity to feel like a crew, a set of one and onlys, a love club, all of us together. We have shared institutional and fugitive spaces both, with always a definite preference toward the latter, but this isn't so bad up here. To grow with and alongside one another, and to bring in and along anyone else who might be good vibes. And good vibes is a pronounced feature of Adam's most recent work, his hardest and most ardent thought, 
asserted in this latest cycle of poems as the irreducible need for collectivity and the irrep irrepressible desire for more and better forms of sociality. Such a desire stems first from the recognition of the wealth not only around us, but in and as us, of the plenitude of what he calls, quote, the too much that can stay only by going away. Thus, as one who is going away, I am happiest to report that I have had the immense fortune to have been part of some of the intense and evanescent social experiences sketched in these poems as a proud teammate, friend, and fellow listener in and quote, with songs that call us everyone. Mutually constituting this us is a being whom I have learned much from, who thinks and works and loves hard and deeply and openly. So it is my deepest joy to introduce Adam So the poems I'll be reading tonight have um, combinations of two or three letters for their titles. Um, these letters form acronyms, Arabic roots, initials, anything that can be associated with. Some of the letters are formed, some of the letters are more familiar than others, so I'll offer words for the letters that need them and silence for the, the letters that don't. The first poem is titled DHS. Love, when you try me, don't let me go, but shelter my doubt with enough room to feel the full emptiness of my ignorance until I'm ready to talk again, until my love becomes my doubt, there's too much left of you, too much that could stay only by. This next poem is titled TGT, and it's about feeling nostalgic for a target. The ubiquity of homes I could lose you in, any as close to the one I left to find myself beside another, center of, a center of. This next poem is Turner Network Television. Because I must carry enough for you to see the rest can't be repeated until the portions of my torso are recovered from, from the scene. This next poem uh, is titled LVT and it was inspired by the few seconds um, between the end of the film, Melancholia, and the moment the credits roll the black space between before the, the credits roll. LVT. A black frame means nothing else can fill it till the names of stars release their faces for the end to be seen. It's time to go. Nowhere to leave. The stars save the darkness of the world from the end of the screen. next poem is titled THX. Um, it was conceived in a club in New York on the sprung wood floor salvaged from one of Thomas Edison's warehouses. So Thomas Edison deserves thanks for some of these words. What do I owe you without giving what I have to relinquish in return for your company on this converted ware? house floor, can I praise the opening that let our bodies earn their bodies back, refraining from saving for more. UN. If name is violated by another tongue, does a wrath strike the named one, or do our mouths receive its dumber mass?
so the next few poems I'll read um, get their titles from Arabic radicals. Um, like other Semitic languages, Arabic is formed out of uh, three-letter consonants that are modulated to form different words. Um, it's a language that begins with, with verbs. The title of this poem, Zikr, um, means both remembrance and invocation. In Islam, a, a zikr is an incantation of God's name that conjures the presence of God. Zikr. Because I am allowed to write this, I am allowed because it is allowable to write this. It's law because all law is written. For all, it's right for all because a law is all is all. La ilaha illallah because it's all right for all. It's all audited. This poem is Jannah, means to cover, hide, or conceal. Um, the root forms the word for jinn, which um, you know is the uh, word for genie. Um, heaven, embryo, and insanity. These are words that carry concealment close to their hearts. Jannah. I could speak to you in the next world. It would be the same. Because there's no release from this one, you can't be alone until everything lost gets admitted. I couldn't visit you in the room I'd return to in the same life you want release from, but I'd love the one we'd return to. Because you're there, I want to go with you somewhere. Ibn. This word means son. For you was named that which after you Past what before you was planetary, dark, you followed the part of you severed on its side. They called you golden, golden not after the sun that burns above the days, golden for your blood bereft of kin, endless circulation. My gilded sun, go blind and be that whose name you intermingle with. My orphan gold, lead me from dark ring. an M inside my mouth, an um where my mother should be, a razor hidden under my tongue where my mouth opens, mimicking the one who searches me for metal, um me, I can't repeat those words that move the blade too close against my M or be moved to slip my tongue against its edge, slipping invisibly into you. This next title is, um, is Pop, which means slave or servant. Also used to refer to a servant of God, like Abdul Jabbar, which means a servant of the Almighty. It also conveniently resembles the academic abjection of all but dissertation. <laughs> uh, silence is someone else's mouth. Wait for it to open before you let him in. So. God will spun inward gathers what it broke off from, unwearable, monochrome where my green heart flags from afar. Wahid, this means one. Heaven's hum rhymes everything with sounding clay. We're strays from one another, but the gap among us nay. last poem I'm about to read tonight is um, titled MDA. Um, this poem is about doing ecstasy with Donald Rumsfeld. He said he didn't feel it, but he, he knew all the words to drunken love. Um, MDA. And there is uh, a quote from uh, Rimbaud at the, the top here. Voici le temps, which means uh, behold the time. The only you and I have is the one with songs that call us every one. Between us, we know all the words to them. We love those songs. We love the songs that love the words for you. They give us ones we love. We inly know the only songs between us are the ones that love those words we know. We love 
the songs they give us for the ones we have. They call us words that know no one. Between us is everyone. We love the words to all of them. We know only. Thank you. Hi. Um, the reading by Ann Boyer is always an occasion for celebration. We are especially fortunate to hear her today, on the 1st of May, a holiday that fused a century of workers' revolt to the ancient rites of spring, joining the seditions of communists to those of pagans and witches. And though it is traditional to celebrate May Day by striking a workplace, lighting a trash can on fire, or being beaten about the head by an officer of the law, I hope I can convince you with the following brief introduction that a reading by Ann Boyer is a fine but, no, but perhaps no less perilous conclusion to a day filled with or bereft of such activities. Not only because Ann is a poet whose lines and sentences brim over with the revolts of the underclasses and the oppressed, workers and witches, communists and marauding bands of peasant girls, but because she is a poet of the occasion a poet of commemoration and peroration. Anne often writes with particular readings and occasions in mind, crafting poems dedicated to whatever city it is she happens to be visiting. One of the reasons why Anne has published so little of what she has written over the last few years, um, and she writes quite a lot, uh, despite the clamoring of her readership, is because her poetry is so attuned to occasion and context, and thus the book with its depersonalized and universalizing structure, seems to belie the immediacy and occasionalism of her poems. As much as she is a poet of occasions, she is also a public poet, a poet of the public address. And many of her poems are designed to be read in an outside voice, preferably to agitated and unruly crowds, so you guys will have to oblige. There is a Whitmanic strain to Anne's writing, like Whitman, she is a poet of the list of the lyric catalog as index of boisterous social multitude. These are 21st century multitudes, however. In other words, she is a poet of publics as they exist now, undead publics that shuffle along after the death of the street, the emptying and enclosure of all common places and their replacement by shopping, surveillance cameras, uh, and the various quadrangles that populate our screens. She is a poet of publics, that is, after the advent of the internet. And her poems and other writings capture perfectly the bizarre combination of intimacy and anonymity, grand address and encrypted whisper that we encounter online. A mediation, as she describes it, between the vulgus and the vulness, the crowd, May Day emerges into history, as we know, from the fissure between crowd and wound, between the guns of the police on the one side and the dynamite of the workers on the other. This is where Anne meets us. This is the occasion to which she rises. Thanks, Jasper, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, the first poem I'm going to read tonight is for the East Bay artist who goes by the name of Goon, and it has an epigraph from Lisa Robertson. Her pronoun is sedition. The Girl's City. The Girl's City does not exist. Girls are born into a no place in particular that is owned by men. It matters little where or how. They die there in the nothing as they die everywhere. It matters not where nor how. They have never had a city of their own. The girls have no ruins. They have no histories to forget. There is no language whose words they must unlearn. The girls have no speeches trailing off their lips. The girls have no records to burn. They have no location but the nothing location of the everywhere that is with the men. The girl's city is a vacant city in that it does not exist, and home is a city on its knees. The look that the girls turn on the men's city is a look of lust, a look of envy. It expresses her dreams of possession of herself. 
The men know this very well. When their glances meet, the man ascertains of the girl bitterly, always on the defensive. The girls would like a city for themselves. It is true, for there is no girl who does not dream at least once of freely walking down a street. The world is a world cut in two. The dividing line, the frontiers are enforced by violence. The violent men are the go-between. They are the bringers of the placelessness into the mind of those who are not men. The men's city is strongly built, made of property and violence and women. It is a brightly lit place. It swallows the leavings of the girls' and women's bodies and hours, unseen, unknown, and hardly thought about. The men's home is an easygoing home. The men's home is a city of men and the people who are not men who do things for them and who never have a city called ours. So a few weeks ago, I was in Oakland, Pittsburgh. And I was there with Dana Ward and um, through various events, conversations, Q and A's, the epic kept coming up as a topic. And Dana says to me, he says, Anne, you should write an epic called Oakland, and it should start in Oakland, Pittsburgh, as it had already with that statement. And so I said, well, Dana, I should write an epic called Oakland, called Everywhere, called Oakland. And so I began, and in the week between Oakland, Pittsburgh, and the Brooklyn Poetry Summit, um, I wrote the invocation for the epic, specifically for that site, which I read there. And I'd been thinking, you know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning talked about the epic location of the 19th century as being between the mirrors of the drawing room. I thought, well, what's our epic location? And our epic location was the everywhere called. All those places um, named the same thing or designed to feel the same spread across the everywhere. So every McDonald's, every Starbucks, every prison, every hospital, every university, every college town. And so that's where I wanted to write this, in everywhere called the same. And so, um, as I circulate as a poet, then each part of it comes together, and I put this together for tonight. Um, it's the epic called Oakland, called Everywhere, called Oakland, and this is book one. And it begins with four lines from Rod Smith, which also serves as the epigraph for Buchenspar's Army of Lovers. We work too hard, we're too tired to fall in love. Therefore, we must overthrow the government the banquet hall, the third note of the lyre, victory poems, four letters of the alphabet. Let's overthrow the reconstruction of the faces as they lived at the party before their ruin. And the night, Woolsey Heights felt heavier than the Pentagon and still rose. For from the cloud, we must overthrow the cloud, overthrow Wheeler Hall. For we shall not escape hell, my passionate sisters. So overthrow the starry darkness and heaven in this life. Slovenly needlewomen, all our sewing comes apart, so let's overthrow sewing, the opposite of our temporal disfigurement. Let's overthrow all I have told you, especially in poetry. Overthrow every poem, the vital demystified art, moving through everyone and pluralist. Overthrow the potluck mimetic, the glutting electric suburbs, the cities with their own undulations and commerce, the mall carved in the manner of Sacco and Vanzetti. And overthrowing sobbing mostly, and with every garment rent and unrent, we must overthrow California and overthrow all the gold, overthrow Ann Boyer in the green edge of Oakland, wondering how geraniums could do that, captured soon on the surveillance camera saying, let's overthrow at Blake Street and overthrow at Books, because we work so hard, we are so tired, we should overthrow later then let's overthrow Sky Palace, the contrast, the new sun, the machines crushing scrap metal, the political score, crisis theory, throwing crisis, overthrowing Google entirely, but the public school too, and all the words on the visualizer's wall. Overthrow a million TED Talks by barbarians and the heartbroken, subdressed, angry orchestra of aphasia camboys. Overthrow the internet of sparrows and dynamite and jasper. Let's overthrow this room and all its overlit promises, the substantiating documents, the tinged credentials, the San Quentin furniture. For our tenure is in hell. The years we imagined in the downpour, overthrowing, then overthrow imagining the years. For I must overthrow all I don't know. For I must overthrow all I know. 
this empire of the wide awake into nothing ever again and overthrow all the poets for tomorrow will join what isn't going to be and never or who for we have overthrown tomorrow and all tomorrow's anthologies and all the rooms with all the walls and every table and in that we will destroy the very beds we need for sleeping every riot declares itself as a girl so let's overthrow the government as rod wrote and overthrow poetry's rival government dr williams Overthrow the work, despite all the work I must do, I write this, an epic called Oakland, called Everywhere Called, in the thunderous, not really, of the Mayakovsky dawn, one week from May Day, of poetry's perfect inaction to overthrow anything but feeling. Not Kansas's stormy mornings, not Kansas, not airplanes, not temporality, and not all the debts to pay. For we have been queens of the whole world, first scarcely covered by rags, then with constellations in our hair. We overthrow rags and constellations, the queen, of course, and dying there too, la traviata as a structural quality, an erudite as fugazi, thinned by artisanal feast and accented with ethical diamonds in their yoga studios and farmers markets, the Epicureans banter while earth's heavens in a technarchy dissolves. I did not consent to an aerial view of history, so with every sinew, I write this down, to overthrow you as the barest you and overthrow writing, and long live overthrowing what let's overthrow in starry nights in the apple orchards. Gentle girls, my beloved sisters, my gentle girls, let's throw, overthrow all that is, and why not, really, for we shall certainly find ourselves in hell. Prologue from the epic called Oakland. My friend Beatrice and I were shipwrecked on an alien planet resembling my family's home. And on the stairs, there were two paychecks, one for $30,000 and the other for five. Beatrice and I had seen enough TV to know this was going to be an episode about the rescue of George Clooney, the tall airline pilot who was stranded on the alien planet with us. The question was not a question of staying or going, but how we would survive or why we'd want to. Should we hide the uncashable check, singing the dirge of their uncashability, cover the scar that looks like what will forever be earned, but always ungained? Or should we leave what is unredeemable out, that we may live in the unendorsed of our eventual and probable redeemability on the alien and family stairs, as if tomorrow we would go to the bank, only we just kept putting it off, too cool to even refuse it, slipping into the fiction that claiming the reward had slipped from our minds. It was an anguish of decision that I decided to hide the checks so we would no longer think of loss or time. But still, we thought of time and Hazel, explaining what California was to a gym full of people in a small town in Kansas. They told her they had a town pool, and this made them too California. And she had to explain in this memory we could not choose not to have, me and Beatrice alone and far away from her on this alien world we could not leave. My child had to explain to the people what was not California. And in what is not California, I work in the anguish of the decision to remind ourselves of the earth we will never see again, or the other anguish of our forced and incomplete forgetting. This is why I'm awake right now and typing this. Elegy for Disappearance. We came to our mutual informatization with nothing but style. Styles of indications decorating the artwork, the smell of ungovernability, or how to handle this when undone by that. The blanker are better, are better we no longer believed in, we no longer believed in the few years left. The codes were the damaging, the damages of the governing of a plotter, of the Pacific addictive glamour, glamour and the fingers one by one of a copyist of Courbet's origin myth. Courbet's origin myth, it went. It went, the beginning of the event is a downhill trail of minor Kardashians. Perhaps we are still my head neither criminal nor the question. The question here is what could be, what could be said we wanted. We wanted conditions to get better, better to leave out the spectacular form of instruction of how to ascend from the Turing horror of what's granite. What's granite but that cameras exist simultaneous with conditions, conditions more evidence of the world. 
I left out my grammar for the future dead because I wanted to preserve you for their pleasure in bad faith this account that pretends to accept our end someday. Someday a visualizer corresponding to rumor, to rumor the little filaments of twinned realism spin round the grave. The grave is the internal unseating the city, unseating the city we cry a lot. We cry a lot. The tears suggest a number of problems, problems like we are sad. We are sad because their development is more an account of domestic thinking up of a lot of systemic benedictions to describe a pastoral, a pastoral of come back. Come back, lambent city, and of course, the world. The world, because I want to preserve my love for the pleasure of the blinker opportunity of its forever. Forever, I want to leave out these lectures, the semi-formal of what I can't. What I can't is basically the all-contagious state of preserving, preserving as I am often served by a catalog of my veins, the blue productions of I was just trying to love the calibrations. To love the calibrations, if we should ever, because of how hope persists inside description. Inside description, perhaps we are still in my head, it wasn't an expert elucidation I was after. I was after the crowd in the plaza's headways, holding the future's all unmasking territory in any attempt to end this. To end this, you assign me what I had already assigned myself. My experiments with elegy were the captivated tactical relations to faces. The weapons were sad every time we fought. Those were grim copses time was lost behind. I was lost behind each document. Each document, I collected these many suspect accounts of appearing. Appearing plus poetry is false. Poetry is false, and dreams are death-fisted logistics of the crux of the enormity of the crux of their denial. It's clear by the end of the others who history deprived of names, we needed to actually survive the problem. I mean, I needed to actually survive the problem of what is pitch indifferent outside of language. Outside of language is how a tongue gets real. My mind came to, in the basement of the 21st century, the 21st century, and there you were, a PDF the length of painstaking love. Love is old news. Mostly I'm a continuation of the furniture. Furniture, come back. Come back, whatever dirty style had served to conceal the poets. The poets, the equivalent of the opposite of, is what you left out for me in the fond science. In the fond science we all kept. But we all can't, I still can't believe. I still can't believe we will ever die. Die in what hour? In what hour the glorified vessel closing in? Only our word processing gets out of here. Here, the stagnant hours have ancestors, so all day I've typed, all day I've typed this and left out my grammar for the future dead, the total fiendishness of preserving. So let this be a slight volcano of errant book, book or dying. Conclusion, I left. I left out the assigned elegy, the assigned elegy to perseverate while California burns. While California burns otherwise, I would have to write better poetry, scan every foot toward this intuition of the other, the other California, California under history, under history's satellites, its light allure created data, data than the absence fixed. The absence fixed, I left, I left out the endless season, the no action to correlate to the feeling of always wanting to and on each other's sides. When we met, you said, writing about experience comes at the expense of experience. Experience, I don't know. I don't know why we are given bodies, why we are given bodies than to only have them abstracted like this. Abstracted like this, you see, see, this is obvious, obviously a paradisal song of friendship, a friendship, a bacchanal of the solemn Alps, the solemn Alps, Vesuvius, Ducats, and self-management, self-management, and a light verse for this evening, this evening of regeneration of the flight still missing. This air dropped polemic of touch, touch sparingly honeyed by the prize fight of fingertips that fully believed they could transubstantiate the common, the common I left. I left out my elegy for the future, for the future dead, because I wanted to preserve an apology. An apology on the quantified earth. On the quantified earth, there's no ground. There's no ground left under which to weep. There's no ground left under which to weep for Adonais to weep for Adonais anyways, and time. Anyways, and time. And time's unsurvivable, I guess. So, only one fragment of the Greek poet Praxilla's work survives. 
and it's from her hymn to Adonis. And in it, Adonis, in response to the question from the shades of the underworld, what's the most beautiful thing you left behind, answers. Finest of all the things I have left is the light of the sun, next to that the brilliant stars in the face of the moon, cucumbers in their season, and apples and pears. This fragment survives because Zenobius quoted it to explain the proverbial expression, sillier than Praxilla's Adonis. Sillier than Praxilla's Adonis. Every poem till the revolution comes is only a list of questions. So mourn for each poet who must purge from their verse, their verse. Every poem till the revolution comes is only a list of questions. Like should it stay or should it go? Like that poem of Oki Sugumi, should I stay or should I go? And with that line, oh, oh, always the same crisis of being. Should our clausal pileups rearray, or should our songish temporality stay against the way the foundation aggregates all poems to aesthetic inconsequence? Always the same crisis of should our love stay dolce still novo and the world go, or should our love go sad and ashamed to its dissolution in a tangle of, of narrative and the world stay every inch of it own? Should the empty-eyed stay at the screen and the stars go to shine at the subterfuge of all who are the most for staying only barely alive in the algorithmic atmosphere of the crisis of always rewriting these poems that should go to you to rearrange all hard drives into an anagram for oblivion? But I hate, as always, what should stay, how I loved literature, but what I loved about it were the reproductive organs of capital. Capital, that should go. So should the poem really go, every poem till the revolution comes is only an act of museology? And should it stay our extinction, or should it all go away midway upon the journey of our life in a dark forest like Brooklyn, evanescent with breaking into symptoms of the larger problem of everything named the same but the wrong thing, that windy subway where there is nothing to eat? All who went to prison should go, clemency and intact, into whatever resurrection day floats in the western seas. Should it stay the sea or go beyond sea level to bathe the once human streets? Should we go to that premature and into the atmospheric where we have wrenched ourselves too often into the absolute contortion of romance for every us who will not stay long enough on this earth and with whom I hate whatever should go? The epic poem here is that so much should go. Bosses, wages, husbands go. All that is governable go. The hostile objects go. The violent configurations go. The anodyne platitudes go. The maladies of the centaurians go. But not how we came to the resistance with nothing but style for Pasolini should stay. Should stay like that night in Dresden when Bakunin told Wagner in a low roar that if all other music should be devoured in the fire that would soon consume the world, the world which should go. It was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony that should stay, even if they have to die for it. But Wagner and Bakunin went. Beethoven went. I will go. You will all go. Fires in the world might stay. But should all go, like Diane de Prima's All the Works of Mozart, Not Worth One Human Life, or this new epic I practice upon our homemade flutes? But should it all stay, these conditions, where will we all then go? Into the vile memory of events and centuries? Joshua Clover told me that if all other music should be devoured in the fire that would soon consume the world, Joni Mitchell's California should stay. It played in the streets of St. Louis when I read a poem for California. And should St. Louis's unjust streets stay unjust, Kansas City's unjust streets stay unjust, Cincinnati's unjust streets stay unjust, Oakland's unjust streets stay unjust, or the iPhone in my purse that auto-serenaded me go? Into the same crisis of being of what? For not everything should go, I think. We'll need some supplies, wine cash, condoms, mascara, Alexandria, engineering. The poems of Victor Valera Mora, I celebrate myself in poetry like someone who celebrates their wedding with a knife. He also wrote, everyone is the absence of all subjects, so all subjects should go for everyone. But it, should it stay, the roulette wheel on which our number caught its extra fate? Should it stay, this extra fate? 
or should Fortuna go now absolved, virtuous, into the after party in a professorial blazer? This morning, no one writes to me, so should this stay unheard so I can pack for California? Or should this poem go into the premature night of 1 p.m.? This poem might stay, stay a secret archive of the same crisis of being, go only to my files, or should I read it for that surveillance camera where it will go to the internet? Or should it stay that I am too ugly to speak in any but the ancient dialect and need a thousand dithyrams to soften this? Come back in stuttering first hand and tell me your poems. Where should it go? All of a sudden, go to all of a sudden the city on fire. My fire, probably. Should it go an arsonist, I guess? Or should it stay this? For receiving no pay for this, I volunteer as a soft minister of burning up the known and unknown, brothels, daycares, call centers, living rooms, city blocks, the women and children glowing finally like animals, more visible than nature. I knew it. I am that woman. I have a child. The once empty factories are busy now with unions of flame, cooperative, and mutual. Our legislation is goals like sparks circling and mayors and law enforcers, award winners too, dashing through the alleyways, trailing themselves and diminishing into a not even history now. While everyone stencils on red coals, no more tyranny or materiality. You are us and ghouls, this bright incendiary something to set fire with no matches. My austerity and sitting combustible and having all of a sudden, as a consequence, manufacturing an accident all around me. Should it stay or should it go? This all of a sudden burning city, this world. But I saw Momar, nothing was on fire as predicted. OMG, the universe, most of it missing, was what Jasper Burns wrote. And also what terrible humanism in the overgrowth what idealism in the mangled timetable. A question for poets is, can you feel good? A question for poets is, who will record the crime that power commits? The commune was dead. The swallows of Paris were dead. They'd eaten the flies poisoned by the lime poisoned corpses. What kind of living is this dying which enlivens the corpses in our temporal morgue? Where's the moment that in defeat Times puts apart. I wanted life without lifestyle, sex without sexiness, how to be a voluptuary without voluptuousness, or whatever it was the opposite of the total aestheticization of everything existing. Against elegance, inelegance, opinion, critique, and comfort, against the boring and repetitive performance of freedom required of us because we are unfree, against the boring and repetitive performance of unfreedom required because we are free. During the years I lived on this earth and under this empire, I was trying to understand how we were automatons whose actions were set to agency. Greenery, motion, large cats, clouds, insects, seasons, the alien smell of eucalyptus in the Berkeley Hills. All was Oz and inextricable, and I bought into preemptive mourning for these. That night, the lanterns became brighter than the sun itself, this is eternity's happy variant, the planet on which out of this light the walls of the prison fall away. The dead who are communards return to join the communards who are the living women and children. The dead are all alive again and bearing guns. Louise Michel said, from time to time, the earth disgorges its corpses. In another of eternity's variants, a student brings Louise Michel a book of poems by Louise Michel. And in this book of poems by Louise Michel that the student brought to Louise Michel, I read this poem, Against the Police, by Miguel James, and translated by Guillermo Parra. My entire oeuvre is against the police. If I write a love poem, it's against the police. And if I sing the nakedness of bodies, I sing against the police. And if I make this earth a metaphor, I make a metaphor against the police. If I speak wildly in my poems, I speak against the police. And if I manage to create a poem, it's against the police. I haven't written a single word, a verse, a stanza that isn't against the police. All my prose is against the police. My entire oeuvre, including this poem, my whole oeuvre, is against the police. So, in one video, on the chalkboard, there's this new word, communism. 
the one I like best is the video from a couple of years later in which the sun is shining so brightly over their shoulders and into the camera that at least from 32 seconds to the one minute and three second mark, and if I turn off the sound completely, I can't tell what's going on, except there is a sun and that it shines, and there are humans with shoulders and another human, at least one, with a camera. There's another version I watch only when I put something in front of it to block the screen. And in it, one person says, concerned, hey, don't do that. And another says, what are you doing? And another says, take it easy. And another, he'll stop. And then boo. And then another says, shame on you, man. And then a lot of shame on you. Then fuck you, pigs. Then stop. And then stop. Screamed and wailed. This is what happens when one threatens the rule of property, making visible the nightsticks and pepper spray which undergird everyday life down here and help hold the building. Everything belongs to everyone. Remember? How do you dance at a party where you want to kill everyone? Danny says, with blades on. Remember, all sex is sex work, except for the sex of kings. Remember, no one buys poems, but so many ways to buy poets. Remember, remember the decorous nonviolence of our formalism? That's when we were whores. Remember that at work on May Day poem that so many, maybe some of you, maybe a hundred people wrote last year? The one that went in part. We are at work on May Day, driving one hour to a university, administering a final that took eight hours to write, driving one hour home, grading the exam for three hours. We are at work on May Day making dinner for a child, breastfeeding an infant, preparing a snack for a hungry kid. We are at work cleaning house, folding diapers, still warm from the dryer, getting the separation papers notarized, and massaging cold butter into flour with our fingers for an order of three office party pies. We are at work moving bottles of hair product into rows. We are at work on May Day trying our hardest to get as many new signups for Gap Inc. credit cards, folding clothes, making as many big sales as possible. We are at work on May Day looking for work. We are at work looking for work. We are at work looking desperately for work. We are at work taking an hour off of work to look for more work. We are at work looking at resumes, and we are at work on May Day wondering what will happen to the people we reject for work. We are at work on May Day, but we'd rather be generally striking. We are at work on May Day trying to make the Facebook like button work. We are at work adding a period to the sentence, revolution cannot be mounted from the state, but only against the state. Period. We are at work on May Day making tiny laminated work icons for students to move from left to right on the board when they complete a task. We are at work on May Day translating Balistrini so you start to understand that the only thing to do is burn everything, like will it happen everywhere in a bit when we're ready, then we'll finally change everything here. We'll send them off to go fuck themselves, all of them, and their shitty work. We are at work on May Day translating Raymond Sucra a requested service in a flotilla of pearl fisher fishermen, and I traversed a crystalline gulf. Anyways, do you remember the epigraph for that poem, the one from Diane de Prima, the one that went, all prisoners are political prisoners? My advice, if your hands are up, they'll want them by your sides. If your hands are by their sides, you'll want, they'll want for you to hold them high. This is so they can shoot you also so you'll grow confused. To be so soft, so innervated, with a daring stench of duplicity, to be alive at a time like this is to be a corpse upon a heap of smart cars, animated by rumors and brutalities. This is research, it's called a binary tree. Athens is the left child, ardor is the right. There are so many transactions going on right now. On the surface, they appear with no lavish processes, but it's like they wanted to kill us. We showed up in the quadrant and everyone wanted us to die. The satellite waxed predictably, skittering across cell towers, dripping hot data onto the skirts, the slums of cities. Everyone wanted us to die, as if mere appearance were provocation. But children, my celestial labor is to forget thee. Evenings were small parties devoted to the discussion of conceptual gallows. Mornings in El Dorado, we carved the greatest hits of graduate programs into the highest branches of the tree. It was the hilarity that there exist people who suffer. It was that a vision could shut down their plant. Whatever we did, they were weighing us down with bullets. The masses are slow and full of lead like that. Please, let's meet. I must speak to you 
about an urgent transaction, but I am very sorry because it is about this that I cannot speak. But if we should ever meet IRL, let's draw magic circles in which to conjure preservative emancipatory instruction manuals, a secret notebook of the subtweeted dialects of an electric city where the blues are always encoded but never sung. In the long night of a sorceress in the de-alphabetized universal history, these instruments deliver speeches blinding as Elrads. We could sense our destiny as a dog could sense a wolf's encryption. So as Dana Ward writes in that story, In the Crisis of Infinite Worlds, about taking his daughter Viv to California to humor her teenage obsession with pre-revolutionary culture, the story written from the other side of the end of the country. Dana says, I'm worried I wrote this too early in the morning when the sky above our house was like the sky from California. I'm worried I wrote this too early for the sky above Kansas City is only the sky above Kansas City. I wasn't in California, I was on the internet. Did I explain that these days were the days when the people wrote on machines that connected to machines that connected to machines that connected to people who wrote on machines? Those were the days we believed in information. Those were the days of crude luxury and genteel sorrow. Those were the days I loved to delete. The problem with my friends' bodies then was that I could see them being beaten on the screen, and the problem with my friends' bodies then was that I loved them, and I could see them being beaten on the screen. And I remember that year we walked in the deep rain to Wheeler Hall, and I told my daughter, they'll someday name this building after him, but I made a mistake about the future. I made a mistake about the future. Now there's no such thing, really, as the public ever again. We fractured into temperate and intemperate zones, small service colonies, and into villages surrounded by walls made of inoperative cars. We can barely remember what once made us, and the first and last thing any of us thinks about is poetry. I'm surprised when we don't happen every minute of history. I could end with the futureless bounty, I promise the incident called ours. I forget to have lived in such a way to generate material evidence that I've never been the greatest obstacle to vision is nothing. We've always been the future's intimate, and our oeuvre is loitering like a teenager with an animal, an incurious eye, begging to be loved in no maudlin extraction like a cannon. But at the blockade, its privacy bleeding out to a perfect fire. So I keep in my heart the spoils of the empire. I keep in my empire the spoils in my heart the great looting of the empire. I keep my heart in this machine. It's great to keep my empire in a computer made of hearts. I keep in my machine the everywhere gasping springtime each season of the empire. I keep in my empire more fair than my heart. I keep in my heart an empire more rosy fingered than dawn where I keep in my empire the spoils and time. I would like to tell you without any poetry that I keep in my heart formlessness and justice and in my heart an empire of form. My body keeps my empire with its food and its service plans, with its cars and its turnings and its screens and its sexiness. My empire is looking like a god. And my empire is in my heart just like every other empire, always expanding and dissolving like a robber baron keeps his castle, like a petty vandal keeps her city, or also like a thief who is a girl. I keep in my heart my empire its spoils and keep in my common heart the drones of the common empire, the radars of empire, robotic arms of empire, the nanotechnologies of empire, the corrective surgeries in interdisciplinary departments, the wired and unwired configurations, the profits both personal and impersonal, the suffering both public and privatized, the profitless profits of universities, the invisible hands of the invisible workers, the invisible hands of mostly women and children. I keep in my empire the empire's hands I keep in my heart an empire of the sleeping and unsleeping crowd. I keep in my common empire, my heart also common. The empire is spoiling the loo of the body, also the loo of the flourishing body. I keep the detectable and undetectable contaminants, the green and the ungreen, my love and technology, and the technology of my common heart. I keep in my empire my justice and my vulnerable feelings. I keep it in word docs, emails, PDFs, and in books. I keep in my empire all the kings and the ballers. I keep in my empire the workers and beggars. I keep in my empire the information technologists. I keep in my empire all the government contractors. I keep in my empire my heart and the spoils. But these were the words I removed. I removed the 
The name of this piece is code for a girlish docudrama of thought. I removed us, us, as a lexicon. The bionic going, the vernacular inflected with vehicle, some even called it a crystallized popular rebellion. Just liminality and meteoric company. In my interlocutors, this is like how you will, as you see them, trick yourself into believing Berlin is intact. I removed, here's my grip on the tableau, with a lyric hollering ever of the substructure, and I dare you to look us in the eyes. I dare you even to, in dialectical opposition. I removed, it's the first time this has been shown in the American Midwest. And finally, I removed, variations on this refrain were my remedy for geographies, bylaws, and impositions. We work too hard, we're too tired to overthrow the government. Therefore, we must fall, and have fallen, not in some loss of Eden, but from the loss of the loss of Eden's loss post post lapsarian post post mortist. Heaven run with cop, nothing obscured from street level view, and not how the bard has fallen to perform an instructional video on how to produce culture on May Day. The theme of tonight's reading was all comfort is in air, and no platitude will go remorseless into the anodyne night. Everyone showed up, all of you, clear and institutional, like triage and in the wrong light. You gave me a lot of advice on the white floors of a particular history where we had been arranged and then a chorus began to sing. It was an introduction for a reading at a large public university in California. The chorus sang inaccurately about the genealogy of ravines. They sang from 12 hymnals, each titled a variation on poetry in the age of empire. And it's true, I didn't make that up. I'd sign permissions for this book. I'd sign permissions for poetry in the age of empire on Monday, April 28th. Poetry in the Age of Empires, last chapter, was to be my common part. All with snakes tied in knots on the covers, these were my works and all these attempted songs were mine. In order to make up for what I'd done wrong, I'd appear near Oakland, California, bearing one book from an epic called Oakland, called Everywhere, called Oakland, in the epic location of the Everywhere called. I didn't want to say neoliberal in a poem. I didn't want to say Anthropocene in a poem. I didn't want to say university in a poem. I didn't want to say poetry or at work. Not love, not hearts, not empire, not nothing, not Balestrini, not Oakland, not for the consequence of art and not for the inconsequence of art, not Wheeler Hall, not overthrow, not anything, but what I'd seen in the underpass where I'd lived quietly for 40 years. I was no rustic man, but too clumsy even in the eyes of the unskilled. I was not a field hand, but ill at ease among the educated classes. I had been known to have read a certain number of books concerning rare affects in common cities, but I was not interesting by birth. I knew the songs of every bird, but I'll admit I knew nothing of the gallantries of justice, of beauty, of guns, of rational love. I'd intended this to be an epic as a symphony, as an elegy, as a pastoral, as a novel, as a subtitle, as an epigraph, as a style sheet, as a recognition, as a remix, as a Tumblr feed, as a memory palace, as a love letter, as a communique, as a selfie, as a to-do list, as a history, as a form of apology. For I came to the Oakland called Carthage, a cauldron of unholy love, and the elsewhere of ever called elsewhere for setting right against temporal disfigurement, memory that had been set wrong. So if you need me or know the answers to any of my questions, maybe if you're watching this, you can send me an email and I'll try to respond. For as Rod Smith wrote, we work too hard, we're too tired to overthrow the government. Therefore, we must fall in love. Questions for poets. How does one take care of the women who are transident? How does one take care of the girls in your dresses? How does one take care of the great poets who is a woman, who is a girl, who is a mother, who is not a mother, who has never had a child, who has had many children, who is fertile, who has aborted, who has miscarried, who has had sex, who has been chased, who is a mother or not a mother, who is a girl or a woman, but a man also or boy, and is transient, these women, and women identified men, and men identified girls? How does one take care of the raped, the great thinkers? How does one take care of this gender? What is the form Whitmonic from a mother? What is the form of situationist from an administrative assistant? 
what is the form of immortal from a girl? What are the ways we are rivaled? And who will be the theory of our love who turns but does not extricate? And when shall we embrace each other? We wonder. What resembles the grave, what isn't. Always falling into a hole, then saying, okay, this is not your grave, get out of this hole. Getting out of the hole, which is not the grave, falling into a hole again, saying, okay, this is also not your grave, get out of this hole. Getting out of that hole, falling into another one, sometimes falling into a hole within a hole or many holes within holes, getting out of them one after the other, then falling again, saying, this is not your grave, get out of this hole. Sometimes being pushed, saying, you cannot push me into this hole, it is not my grave, and getting out defiantly, then falling into a hole again without any pushing. Sometimes falling into a set of holes whose structures are predictable, ideological, and long dug, often falling into the set of structural and impersonal holes, sometimes falling into holes with other people, with other people saying, this is not our mass grave, get out of this hole. Altogether, getting out of the hole together, hands and legs and arms and human ladders of each other, to get out of the hole that is not the mass grave, but that will only be gotten out of together. Sometimes the willful falling into a hole, which is not the grave, because it is easier than not falling into a hole, really. But then once in it, realizing it is not the grave, getting out of the hole eventually. Sometimes falling into a hole and languishing there for days, weeks, months, years, because while not the grave, very difficult still to climb out of, and you know after this hole there's just another and another. Sometimes surveying the landscape of holes and wishing for a high quality final hole. Sometimes thinking of who has fallen into holes which are not graves, but might be better if they were. Sometimes too ardently con contemplating the final hole while trying to avoid the provisional ones. Sometimes dutifully falling and getting out with perfect fortitude, saying, look at the skill and spirit with which I rise from that which resembles the grave, but isn't. Thanks.